So I'm going to go back in. I'm going to start on this ox. I'm just going to build up the yellow. My palette's already built. I'm going to use this apple box to kind of start. I don't know. You know, I always have these themes that I do uh, that I talk about. But today, it's been a while. So I don't really have any topics. But uh, if you guys have a topic for me to talk about, that's great. I guess I should just talk about Ross since this is probably going to be my last uh, week, you know, working on this, uh, you know, like full time. And then I'll be touching it up in the background, kind of like what I'm doing with the Kim Two Kingdom over there, you know. I start out uh, getting, you know, about 75 to 80 percent of the painting done. And then on the part that, you know, the other part, I just kind of take my time, you know. And uh, let me get everything together. Sometimes, one thing about painting every day, man, that, that gets you on a roll, man. You can start getting, start getting hot, man. You say, like, your painting skills, you know, they don't, they get better. I mean, you're tired as I don't know what, but just your painting skills get on kind of on point. You do things faster, you do things quicker, more efficient. You know, but also uh, you can get tired and you start taking shortcuts with your work too. So, you know, it's like a, it's an artist thing. It's like an artist block. Sometimes you, uh, you get working and you start getting jaded from your work, you know, and you just can't do as good of a job because you start getting, you don't want to ever get to the point where you're working on something. You just get tired of it. <laughs> you know, it's your own project. You know, the project, uh, you almost start, I'm not going to say you start hating your work, but, you know, it can get like that. So what I'm going to do is just, you know, yellow is a very difficult color because even though I'm using cadmium yellow light, <clears throat> um, yellow just by virtue of being yellow still can be translucent. And then you put it down and you hope that it goes down nice and opaque because you're using the opaque yellow. You're not, there are, I think uh, lemon yellow Hansa is especially designed to be a transparent yellow, uh, you know, for, you know, adding, you know, a lot of times people like to use that in flesh tones, in various tones where they just kind of want a translucency in the, in the paint, you know, just from the, from the get go. But you know, with, with yellows, you can make them translucent anyway, you know, almost, there's almost no need of having those colors, but they do mix different, you know, when you mix them with other colors, that's when you start getting an advantage of having multiple uh, colors that appear to be almost the same, you know, when you pull it out the tube, but the qualities of mixing them are different, you know? So, uh, but what I'm doing with this yellow is <clears throat> going in and just reinforcing because uh, at the end of the day, you know, I'm getting to the final steps. And nobody's gonna understand that um, later on that, oh, well, that yellow is nice, but it just doesn't look as strong as it could look, you know? Why didn't he go down, why did he put these colors down rich and heavy and thick and strong? The colors are just, have presence, you know? It's not so much the, the color, but the thickness of the color. As it sits on top of the canvas, you know, it has presence. You know, um, you can f physically see the brush stroke sometimes, you know. And in, in these paintings, even though I paint kind of realistically, I like to have brush stroke. That does take, actually it takes away from the realism because sometimes people can get out of the, the, the illusion and they get into the actual surface. They get into the brush stroke, you know. They get into what you did. Now, that's a fine line. You don't want to have something where people get out of your painting and start thinking about your process. And then you kind of lose them in terms of your concept, you know, in terms of the illusion you're making. But at the same time, uh, depending on, you know, what you want them to look at. A lot of times, like I say with Rembrandt, people look at his paint, you know, they look at the way he put the paint. They say, you know, that the way he painted that garment is not necessarily photorealistic, but it still looks photorealistic, you know? I mean, I see brush strokes, I see textures, and you get into the paint, you know, the paint quality. 
Of course, you know, people who push that to the limit, people like Van Gogh, I always talk about that, where you still get your, 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 your uh, the paint is very obvious in Van Gogh. I mean, before you see what he was painting, you see, you kind of start seeing the way he painted it. Say, oh man, that's kind of, it's, he's painting something realistically, you know, but it doesn't look realistic, you know, but you know exactly what it is, you know. Uh, now, when you get to somebody like Picasso with Cubism, uh, he's actually painting something too. You know, if you look at uh, his Odalista Avignon, Os Odalista Avignon, I mean, you kind of know what he's talking about with those images. You can break it down. And, uh, and then some of his other ones, like especially the ones he did in protest of World War II. I mean, he had a lot of stuff to say about that. He saw a lot of atrocities. And that's the, one of the reasons I'm painting this painting. I'm painting this painting because atrocities. Right now we're in a pandemic. And just before the pandemic, it was threatened, threatens a war. People was threatening war. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we killed the general of a country that we never really fought, you know, uh, officially ever fought a, fought a war with before. And there didn't seem any real reason that we should even want to be fighting them, unless this is some kind of religious crusade type of thing. You know? Uh, who knows? You know, who knows what's really going on behind the scenes? So that's what this painting is addressing. This painting is Ra. He's outside of the traditional religious, in terms of the West, what we call quote unquote the West, that's going to be Western Europe. Uh, United States, Canada, you know, Christian, Christianity, Christendom, you know, that's the West, you know, and not only just the West, uh, Israel, uh, and all of the Abrahamic religions, including Islam, you know, you have to, I'm using Kemet, I like to use Kemet because for symbols about what I think about humanity, what I think about spirituality, because it is outside the norm. It's it's somebody making a moral and also to a certain level a spiritual judgment. Ra is making a judgment. Look at how he has his hand on his chin there. He has his hand on his chin and he's making a judgment about the earth below. Here you have the earth below him and he's thinking about it. And you can see right there, there's an hourglass and there's a wine goblet full of red wine. So we have some symbolism going on here. Okay, so there's, 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 uh, there's lust, there's passion. It's passion to do wrong, there's passion to do right. You know, what happens when you drink too much wine? You get drunk, you start doing stupid stuff. You know, that's what happens when you get drunk. You know, so, um, Ra right now is, good, is passionate about whatever judgment he's thinking about right now. He's thinking about something. There's a judgment that's going to happen. Whereas the earth is drunk below him. He's drunk also. Or he's drinking. He's not drunk yet. He's thinking. Because he's not juggalugging the goblet. It's just sitting there. And it's full. Well, it's almost full. So he's had a sip. <laughs> Now he's had a sip already. He's had a little taste. That's the pandemic that we're dealing with right now. And could he be passing judgment on the world right now? Could the powers that be be passing judgment on mankind right now with this pandemic? Are we learning anything from this? Is this pandemic teaching mankind anything? I think I, the answer to that for me is yes, it is. This pandemic is teaching us a lot about ourselves, be it good or bad. And we see that there's a lot of bad. I was just looking at somebody's post doing my little break that I was taking. And they were saying, uh, you know, uh, they said, what level of hell are we in right now? You know, are we in now? And then I said, we're going down to the basement floor, below the basement floor. You know, we already was at going down you know we're already there but now we're going down to the basement of hell 
You know, because we were already fighting wars and jacking stuff up. You already saw that nasty, ugly stuff that was happening in the Middle East. All these wars are just for 20 plus years. They've been going on without stop. With no end in sight, by the way. None. It's just going to go on forever. Through now three presidents of the United States. I don't know how many prime ministers of other major countries that call themselves the moral judges of the earth in terms of trying to add some type of peace, some type of normalcy to the planet. I mean, where is that at? Do we have that even? Do we have normalcy on the planet? <laughs> Do we? Yes or no? Have we ever? I mean, is that something like a fantasy? Is it? Is it something that could be realistically hoped for? Or is it just a, the illusion? It's just we're deluded to think. We're, we're just too hopeful to think that human beings can actually do something right. You know? Is that possible? Can human beings do something right? Yes or no? And when I say something right, can we live right? Can we live with each other right? As a society, are we going to be invading each other? Stealing each other's resources? Are we going to keep poor people perpetual when we can easily stop it? But or are we going to just go around and say, oh, well, capitalism is, is good. Everything else is bad. Socialism is bad. <laughs> Why? I mean, actually, the, the pretenses and the purpose of socialism is actually good. They really want to help people that can't help themselves as well but is that going to be at the expense of the people who really do well to, at helping themselves and matter of fact they help themselves to a very very advanced level they become billionaires and powerful people you know and those people actually are the ones who start the wars that involve people who are not billionaires and people who are not powerful people and then the sons of Poor people, poor men, go off to kill themselves. That's basically what they do. They call it war, but it's basically self-suicide. Volunteer, su volunteer suicide. Even for the victor, he's mentally not the same person he was after he get finished murdering his enemy. He's just not. He's a changed person forever. And ever. Amen Ra. That's it. So what are we gaining? What are we gaining by all this stuff? I said we ain't gaining nothing. We ain't gaining one thing. Am I using double negatives? We're not. We're. 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 We're not gaining. <laughs> Can we not use double negatives? But I think you guys know what I mean, because most Americans talk this way anyway. We use bad grammar. But now yes, I know when I'm using bad grammar. Because I want to just talk like regular people talk. But anyway, make a long story short. That's what this painting is about. This painting is about... Now, like I say, I didn't get a chance to tag anybody. So I could be sitting in this live talking to myself. <laughs> and it doesn't bother me to do that. It doesn't bother me at all. Because really, at the end of the day, if I'm a painter in my studio, I'm usually alone anyway, self-quarantine. Usually alone anyway. <laughs> you know? So, uh, I have a camera turned on. If nobody's in the room, it really is absolutely almost no difference for me because I'm still, I still got to paint. The most important thing that I can do is to paint. The most important thing for me to do is not to get shares on my YouTube. By the way, if you guys haven't gone to my YouTube and subscribed, please subscribe. Get your friends to subscribe so I get my subscriptions up. I found out that I actually don't need uh, a thousand subscribers to be able to stream live on YouTube. If I stream into my laptop or my desktop, I believe I can uh, stream on YouTube live. I just can't do it from a mobile device unless I have over a thousand subscribers. So I just found that out. So that's pretty good. 
eventually, uh, I wanted by this point, actually, because I was, was planning on doing these lives for a long time. And I was hoping to um, <clears throat> be able to go to some, some galleries and, and art museums and different spaces that, you know, of nature, in nature, like to natural places to paint and get into some, you know, more meditative things, get into some more, you know, uh, heart and soul things, you know, paint in an environment. That's how I, sometimes that's how I meditate. I just go into an environment and I paint. And, and sometimes I paint elements out of that environment. So, for example, on my next painting, there is a, a forest scene in the background. There's a, it, 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 the battle occurs outdoors. So a lot of times, instead of just getting a random picture off the Internet, I just as soon uh, go to a site that looks like the site I want in my painting and paint it from life right there, be in the space. Pick up that energy, put that in the, in the painting, you know? Again, turn it into a spiritual thing, you know? Turn it into something where I can, I can get a benefit out of it as I paint, you know? Stuck in the studio, you know, you got all these, you know, studio is nice because it's convenient, you know? Whenever you need to take a break, you can just, you know, get sit your stuff, stuff down, go in the other room, take a chill, something like that. But also studios can kind of, um, you know, you, you, when you shut in like this, <laughs> you kind of realize that um, we do like to go out in the sun. You know, we do like to see, uh, we do like to see the sun, you know. We do like to feel the wind on our face, you know. Uh, that's a good feeling. And uh, so with that said, you know. It's nice to be able to go outside. So I'm going to put in some more yellow on my palette. And while I'm up, do I want to get anything? Did I see anything down there that I was feel like I was needing? I don't think so. I think I just needed yellow. Oh, I know what I needed. Some more brushes. So I'm going to grab a long brush, a number one or two brush, a number two brush, number one, a liner. Oh, I don't have a pocket, so I'm not going to grab that many brushes. So I'm gonna just grab my all-around paint brush, a zero, and a number one, number two brush. That's it. Two more, four brushes. That's it. Painting with one. So two on standby sitting here, just in case I need it. I don't have to keep getting up, getting brushes and whatnot, you know. Okay. So back, painting raw again. <clears throat> And I'm working on my next design for my next painting, which is the uh, the war between the Powhatan Indians, or Native Americans, I should say, indigenous people, and the first colony of the English, which was in Jamestown. And that's going to be called 1644 to and uh, now a lot of times people do like to paint popular things that somebody might want to put in their living room. I don't know if I paint those things, you know. I don't know if, if, if you know, I just, those kind of paintings are nice. And I know that if I make those paintings, people are going to want to put them in their living room, you know. Make it the size of somebody's living room wall. They'll buy the paint for you for for a fistful of dollars, you know? If you want to paint like that, be that kind of painter, more power to you, you know? Go for it. Uh, I want to, I like to paint epic paintings. I like to paint, uh, I paint basically for the, for the pleasure of painting the scene. I don't necessarily paint with the idea that I'm gonna sell it to somebody, a specific person, or I'm trying to get, tap into a market. Uh, they say, well, do you want to be a starving artist? It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, that's not my motivation. My motivation is not necessarily to make money. Because at the end of the day, you know, uh, you can't take the money with you when you go. You know, and at the end of the day, uh, you got a bunch of commercial looking art that you leave when you when you when you <clears throat> when you check out of this world, 
as an artist, you got a bunch of commercial stuff you did, but is it is it your your statement? Is it that your legacy? You know, you got a, a lot of art that looks good in somebody's house. Well, you know, I know in the old days when there was, you know, when there was no photography, you know, artists did have a purpose, you know. If somebody wanted a portrait and they wanted to be remembered, they needed to hire an artist. And a lot of artists, including people like Rembrandt that I mentioned before, a lot of artists um, painted portraits. I mean, that's not beneath me to paint a portrait. I mean, I will paint a portrait for somebody who wants one. Anybody who wants some of my artwork, if they have an idea and they really want me to do it, and they're willing to put their money where their mouth is and hire me on consignment or give me a commission to do something, by all means, I am going to do that artwork for them. But if you just suggest something, well, I have to like the idea. If I like the idea, I will paint it. And if that idea tickles my fancy, I mean, if it's like down my alley, I mean, this is what I like, you know? Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Well, I'm going to do that. <clears throat> I'm going to do that idea. But if it's some, something that really ain't one of my things, you're going to have to uh, hire me on consignment to paint that if you want me to paint it. You know, there's a lot of artists out there that paint certain things like that. That's all they do. But like I say, at the end of your career, at the end of your lifespan as an artist, there are certain expressions you want to get out. It's like a poet. I mean, a poet could write stuff just because it sounds nice. It's going to make people smile and happy. You know, but you know, like even poets like Hemingway and and Edgar Allan Poe, they did some dark poetry too. They did different types of poetry. And then at the end of the day, uh, sometimes it's the poetry that really provokes you, that's really odd, that prevails, you know, that's taught in, in, in institutions, you know, all over the world. Same thing, I think, with artists, with art. With visual art is the visual art that actually is provocative. That is um, that is embraced long after the artist is no longer around. You know. So you know what you want to do is, it, but at the same time, even if nobody embraces your art ever, you just are an obscure artist somewhere. You know. At least you have a body of work. Hopefully large, you know, the larger the body, the harder it is to ignore your work. <laughs> you know, somebody's going to want well-made pieces, a lot of them. They're going to become a collection. They're going to be collectible. Somebody's going to see the value in that. And then, of course, that preserves your, your artwork, preserves your message as an artist. That's if you're an artist with a message. Not all artists have messages. Some artists are just about visual expression, and that's it. You know, they just make it abstract pieces that kind of hit you at a certain emotional level. Or they're just making pieces that, that hit you a certain way, and that's all they're really interested in. They're not really interested in trying to say anything specifically, figuratively, in the paint, in the painting. My art is actually interested in concept. You know, what's going on in the painting is actually telling a story. My art is storytelling art. My art tells a story. It's the type of art that um, is going to express an idea. You're expressing an idea. You're not just, um, you're not just painting pretty pictures. You're sharing ideas. And so at the end of the day, I want to share my ideas. Not only do I make art just because I like sharing my ideas, I want to share my ideas over a span of many generations. So visual arts is a great way to do that. A lot of times, um, I mean, we still listen to artists, musical artists like Beethoven and Chopin, you know, people like that. However, 
Uh, there's a lot of artists in the middle between those guys, musical artists, that we've forgotten. You know, they were big in their day. But nobody knows who they are. That particular period is not like the same period of Beethoven and Brock and all these people. I mean, it's just different. So they didn't get that same kind of, you know, footnote in, in history, you know, in terms of what the masses are going to remember in terms of being a musical artist. I mean, a lot of music, I mean, think about it. How about the musical artists during the time of the colonial period? Who were they, you know? Or not, not even the colonial period. Let's go uh, during the time of the, uh, after the Civil War in the United States, you know? I mean, or, you know, in American uh, visual uh, musical artists, you know? Specifically that, you know? We're very hard pressed to, I'm pretty sure there was people. Or just say from the 1920s and the 19. 40s. I mean, we remember certain people, but they kind of become a little bit put on the sideline over the time, you know. And they're evident once in a while you might see somebody bring up a person, you know, this or that. But we always see the, the Mona Lisa, the 16th ceiling, uh, and people's expression about that, you know, and people's... Um, Feelings about those those concepts that those pieces convey. We always see even pictures of uh, the Venus painting, you know. I think done by Leonardo, you know. And various other paintings, you know. And we uh, they become like iconic images that they kind of become sort of like uh an icon, you know, a symbol of something. You know, like the thinking man, for example. My raw person is kind of in the pose of the thinking man. So a lot of people don't know who the thinking man is, but it's an echo here, you know, of some other artists and their thoughts on things. And uh, and what you do is you reiterate. So at the end of the day, you know, I like to make uh, paintings about about concepts and I paint for to convey ideas. I don't necessarily can paint to come up with an idea that's gonna sell to somebody. I mean that that's not my that's not a motivation at all of mine. I mean it would be nice because financially because people like to prosper financially. I do. I like to prosper financially. Uh, however uh when you forsake that, and I've done that before, I forsake that. When you forsake your art, you know, your fine art expression for some commercial uh, success, for some, for a paycheck, for some money. You only have so much time allotted in a life, you know. You live so long and you're only going to be healthy to paint however amount of time you get, you know. I mean, you're going to, you're going to count your blessings for all the time you get, but... You know, you have to be good with your with your money. You have to be uh, with not with your money, with your with your time. Because at the end of the day, you cannot buy time. You can't buy time. So it takes time to paint pictures. And you can't once that time is spent, it's gone doing something else. You not, can't necessarily get it back. So if you have certain things to say with your creativity best just to say it and express it and then let the powers that be take care of you financially you know if somebody want the painting they're going to pay for it somebody like the, your work they're going to sponsor you they're going to do something to keep you working <clears throat> usually to keep you working what they do is buy one of your paintings you know because because they think that you should continue to do what you do uh, not everybody can do that, you know. That's why there are prints available. You know, I have stuff on Zazzle, or you can just DM me, purchase my prints. All that stuff keeps me going so that I can continue to express. 
certain things that I need to express. You know, that's that's important for me, you know, to be able to do that. That's very important. Um, because, you know, we talk about voices being silenced. You know, I mean, people say, well, our voice is silent. You know, really? That's, that's a way to make your voice heard. You got the sponsor to people who is saying what you need to say. You know, there's, you know, we can do it politically, you know, by voting for the people who think like us or by sponsoring those first people financially so that they can run, you know, by getting that person, finding that person, recruiting that person, and then <laughs> financing that person so they can run. So you get, or be that person yourself, you know? There's a lot of ways to get the voices. You know, we can sit there and complain about stuff, but at a certain point, you have to, you gotta do something. <clears throat> So as an artist, you have, to, you have to do it. You have to do the work. You have to make the paintings. And it is get your voice as an artist heard. And if they don't sell, who, do, who cares? You have to get your voice heard. And you have to figure out how to get yourself the money that you need so that your vision can go forward. Otherwise, what's going to happen is your vision, what you have to say is going to go away. Is when you are no longer able to put anything out, it's not going to get out. It's not, never going to be out. Your time upon the earth, your light to shine upon the earth may be over with. You may find yourself 70, 80, 90 years old, 100, 150. Who knows what we're going to live to? But... You might find yourself a very old person, you're physically not able to, to paint. And then you're sitting there for whatever amount of more time you get to live, you know, hating yourself because you didn't do something you knew you were meant to do. You know, you ever been to a place where you feel like I was meant to do certain a certain thing? I mean, I was put here on this earth to do a certain thing. I don't know how many people have been like that. I know that's what I'm. I was put on this earth to paint, not to do anything else. Now I've done some other stuff, thinking that okay, I'm, I'm relevant. I mean, this is this is how I help. This is how I contribute to society. But I was wrong. I was mistaken. I was really put on this earth to do exactly what you see me doing. Right now, you know, like I say, if I have one fan, zero fans, no fans, a million fans, if I had a hundred thousand people buying my work, but nobody buying my work, it wouldn't matter at all to me. It'd be all the same. Because at the end of the day, it's about, um, at the end of the day, it's really about, um, <clears throat> did I make every vision, every expression? that I wanted to make. And like I say, some expressions, you don't even know that you're gonna make them until you actually, to that, to the idea is born in your mind, but you're in a position where you can, can, can uh, produce that work once the idea gets germinated in your mind, you know? I call it the Dawood powers. Once the, once the, the, the idea is birth or the Pata powers, once the, the idea for a painting is a birth in your mind. You know, you want to be in position to actually produce that painting. You know, people say, I'm a producer, you know, I'm a record producer. Well, a producer is anybody to produce. I'm a painting, I'm a producer, I produce paintings. <laughs> I'm a producer too then, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, we get all these words that go with these industries. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're kind of producing your concepts. It could be your concepts in music, your concepts in culture, but you are producing something, you know? It's not just some soundtracks that make me bobble my head a little bit, pat my foot a little bit, want to get up and wiggle my booty and dance around the floor. I mean, that's good. That's, it's, that's, a, that's a very good thing, though. I mean, it's nothing wrong with it. Absolutely nothing wrong with it, you know. I mean, if you can make somebody happy through your music, I mean, music is transformative. It transforms the spirit. 
You know, music is transformative. It's a very powerful thing. But guess what? So is visual arts. Visual arts is transformative too. It is very powerful. What people see is very powerful. Uh, certain images. You know, if you're in a society where all your images that you see, and I was talking to somebody about African women, they want to bleach their skin. They want to put the contact lenses in their, in their eyeballs. They want to wear the, uh, the wigs or hair pieces, whatever you call them. You know, they want to um, straighten and process their hair. You know, the reason that they want their hair is born nappy. And maybe it's better if they have short hair, but they get a wig so they have long hair. Because they see all the images around them in the media. This is media. Painting is media. I even call the, what I use a medium. You know, I mix a medium. <laughs> it's just a, it's, it's a media, a medium, or anything like that. It's just a, a vehicle by which you convey ideas to other people. You know, whether it's videotape on television through broadcast. Or actually, this is a medium. This is social media. It's video that's going through the internet. Internet is a media. I mean, internet is more powerful than television nowadays, you know? It's media. So I am working with oil media doing social media. <laughs> so I'm working with two different kind of media. And if I took some of the music that I made, I made a little, some little tunes, you know. I could play that in the background, and I'll have three different types of media going simultaneously. So media can be uh, many things, and they can be used as multimedia together. Like I said, you could do social media, painting, musical, all kinds of performance. You know, in a sense, this kind of thing I'm doing now with this live is a type of performance. I mean, I'm basically performing a live painting in front of your eyes. So in a sense, this is also a performance. You know, uh, it's not much performance, it's just my hand wiggling back and forward. <laughs> However, it is, you're seeing me perform the painting. A lot of times artists are in their studio painting and you don't see anything to their finish. Most of the time, they don't even they keep everything a secret. Most people don't even get to learn what they're going to do until they're ready to reveal it. You know? So, it's a, it's a performance right now. That's what this is. So, what I'm doing is just reinforcing this yellow down here. And I'm going to let this coat dry. And, um, and I was thinking about also what I can do here for these lives. Instead of doing these big, long paintings that take two, three, four, five, six, seven weeks to do, you know, like that one over there took about seven weeks. This one right here is, is two weeks going on. It's the first day of its third week right here. So two weeks and one day so far on this one. And so that'll be 15 days on this one. <clears throat> but um, I was thinking about just doing some short one day paintings. You know, where it's just a, a head. And I and you know, and I'll do these kind of like um I think people I've been looking at my social media in terms of what people like to see, you know. And people do like to hear me blah 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 and these when I do this. Some people do. I don't know if they like it or not, but they seem to be listening. So I don't but the thing is not telling me they they're not commenting. Some of them do give me some likes, you know. I got to look at the likes. You know, but I don't know if they give me a like because they're my friend and they want to be friendly with me and they want to encourage me or if they give me a like because they really like what I said. So I have to go by random people who basically check out these lives just from the search engine. You know, not people that I kind of meet and say, hey, go over to my social media. But just people who just search my YouTube. This YouTube analysis is very nice. And I don't, yeah, I guess the Facebook has one too. I guess I should look at that. But I don't live into my business Facebook account. I live into my personal Facebook account because when I went to first do start doing lives, it was kind of, you know, it was just too many tools and stuff for the business one. And I just, 
I got overwhelmed. I just said, oh, man, I just I keep it simple, man. Just, you know, set it up. This is easy, you know. Use this one. So I use this, this personal one. And maybe I should set up for the business one, go into the business account through these lives. If somebody is an expert at this, please uh, DM me and give me some help. Give me some, some tutorial, man. I mean, I'm kind of old school in that regard. I learned, I like to talk to people and let them kind of tell me stuff as opposed to just Googling it online. I don't like that. That's real impersonal. I mean, I can do it. I do it with a lot of stuff. But I much rather um, talk to people and learn that way. Uh, because I guess I'm old school and, you know, I'm a human being. I like to do stuff the human way. I don't like to do stuff the machine artificial intelligence way, you know? I think what's happening now is people are becoming way too, uh, you know, they're le losing their social skills, you know? The manners and the elegance of personality is going away. I think uh, I see a lot of these young ladies in relationships, they're kind of like, I don't want a guy no more. Guys are this and that. <laughs> it seems like, I think what it is, the guys are just losing that, what they call it, savoir faire. They're losing... You know, they say chivalry is dead or, you know, is there any real gentleman out there or, you know, just guys is just going to do right. <laughs> I don't know. I, th I don't blame it on the girls so much because I think women, can, for the most part, is going to kind of conform to wherever it is the guy is kind of leading, for the most part. I mean, there's some women that they lead. <laughs> They're real good at it. <laughs> I ain't saying I'm not making no generals. I'm just saying... I'm not, not making any specifics. I'm just saying, in general, through my observation, I've seen that a lot of women will prefer, uh, they will basically, if they see a guy's a different way than, say, the guys that they're used to, but they're interested in that fellow, they'll start seeing things that guy's way a little bit, you know? You know? And, uh, and kind of open themselves up to a different his point of view, you know? Because uh, if, if a guy is worth anything, it's salt. He's going to have a point of view on something. He's going to have a, a way of seeing the, the world, a way of dealing with the world. And you can either prescribe to it or not, you know. And I, I think a lot of times people prescribe to some stuff that's not prescribable, you know. It's not, it's not a sustainable way of life, you know. It's not something that's going to get you as far as you think you're going to go. <clears throat> I mean, you might hope that it go far. You might you might not be a person who even think that far. You know, you, you're in a moment person, or you're a person who just want to be living like you know you're an amusement park all the time. You know, like like life is a, is a, is a, is an amusement park for you to be entertained. Well, in a sense, life is for you to enjoy. Yes, you should enjoy your life, but no, life is not <laughs> just to be happy, happy, joy, joy all the time. Life is also, you know, you should you should have a contribution to society. You should actually do something that can benefit somebody else besides yourself in life. I think that is uh, a very important thing. And uh, and I think when we become a society that's all about, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. We lose. Um, our sense of community and doing for others, we lose the sense of uh, goodness, you know, towards other people, compassion, and uh, we become kind of hard edge. Get a hard edge sometimes. The edges get hard. You know, it's kind of like when you don't cut your grass and the weeds start growing up in your yard. You know, start getting kind of rough out there. You know, so, uh, <clears throat> all right, so I'm kind of done reinforcing this yellow. A lot of these darker tones, I'm just going to just kind of scumble in little places where it's missing. Uh, I'm going to paint over those in the future, but it is going to be underpainting. It's going to show through. It's going to be transparencies. And so I want this darker underpainting to be nicely painted. Because even though it's going to be covered, it covers 
things cover better when it's painted better. You know? And so I do want some accurate painting. And that's one thing about taking breaks. You can kind of slow the train down a little bit when you come back. But you slow the train down. And you, like I say, you don't feel like, okay, I got to get something done. Oh, I'm tired. I just want to get through this painting session. When your painting session get like that, you should definitely stop and take a break. Because uh, I don't think you can do your best painting that way. And I think what happens is you start doing things that's not quite the best for your painting. At least that's what I do. So, uh, and that's why I decided to take a break. I decided to take a break because I was starting to take some shortcuts and, you know, and I don't want to get jaded. I want every painting to get my best painting, every painting to get my best painting in, you know. Every session I want to get good painting. I want to, I, you know, and it's a feeling you get when you walk up from your painting session, when you get ready to go to bed or whatever you do at the end of your, because I, you know, I'm on the East Coast, USA. So it's Eastern Standard Time. So I basically paint from four o'clock. And really, even though my lives is over, sometimes I keep painting. Or sometimes I just come and just touch up. Or sometimes I just sit there and just look at the painting. But I'm still in painting mode. Irregardless, I'm still in painting mode till about the time I go to bed, which is basically about 10 o'clock. I try to get to bed around 10, but oftentimes I don't get to bed till like one or two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Sometimes that happens, too. I try to go to bed at 10 o'clock. Let's put it that way. But sometimes I have, like, Facebook buddies that might want to DM me and talk to me. And I just get, I like to talk to people, man. I get to chit-chatting, man. And, uh, or just, you know, my people just call me up want to chit-chat with me. That's cool, too. Because at the end of the day, I just like talking to people. Also, you know, that's one of my favorite things, too. Not just painting. I mean, I actually do have a personality outside of painting that's pretty lively, actually. <laughs> you know, pretty lively. I mean, I'm a, I'm a human being doing human being stuff, <laughs> you know. And I want to enjoy some stuff, too, you know, but... You know, at this at this place in life, you know, a good conversation is nice. It's a very nice thing. It's one of those simple pleasures. Simple pleasures sometimes is the best ones. They don't hardly cost that much. Everybody can participate, you know. And you can do it as often as you want. So I think it's definitely something to be uh, cherished and looked after and done. You know, sometimes it's just, you might not have a lot of money, but enjoy the simple pleasures, man. You don't need a lot of money for that. And don't make life, you know. A lot of times, like me, you know, I can paint like this because I didn't make life expensive. Too expensive, I should say. I mean, somebody said, oh, your life is kind of expensive. I didn't, I could have made my life so expensive, I got to really, really barrel down and really make some paints. I got to sell. <laughs> You know, I could have made life like that, but I didn't. I decided to make life so that I can actually chill out a little bit, relax. You know, you can make your life anything you want. And that's why I tell people, when you make money your number one motivation, you could be robbing yourself. Because then you can't relax, you can't breathe. Because you you're, you're, you're become a slave to making that money. You literally do. And it becomes an addiction, you know? And it's like a, a, like you're a crack addict. And you know that, man, this is consuming me. But you can't stop because you have this drive that's making you want to get the stuff that you know is not really helping you. But you just got to go get it, you know? <laughs> like a drug addict, you know? Like a drug queen. Money can have that effect on you. I mean, people say, well... Uh, guy, you know, he liked to go to the horse races. And uh, I knew of this person. And what happened was um, he would spend his, all the family money. You know, he was uh, 
the lone provider in his family. His wife was just a housewife. He had kids and everything, but he would go down to the tracks and dump all of the money on, on the races. And basically all of the nest egg that the family was saving, everything, was wasted. I mean, he, he was, sometimes he would have a lot of money. He was high rolling. I mean, it just seemed like, you know, it was just flowing. Money was flowing. And then other times he just didn't have it. So at the end of the day, uh, things kind of went bad for him, you know, because um, it caught up with him. And uh, he didn't, he just lost all his money. You know, and so the money that was motivating him basically ended a lot of his happiness. It ended the happiness for him, you know. And uh, so don't make money your motivator. Because if you make money the motivator and not the things you do the motivator, the money actually is what's controlling you and control it, take is that's your happiness. You know, so the lack of money means you're going to be automatically, you're going to be a sad person because everything that about you is based on money. You don't even know how to please somebody in a relationship because you throw money at that person and you equate that with love. And then the person getting the money equates that with love. Because those that's a reward system. That's how you get an addict. That's how the person becomes an addict. How you become an addict in gambling is you uh, your pleasure sensory is, is stimulated. You get all this money and you go shopping. Another addiction is sometimes women who like to shop too much. That's a problem. You always want to buy something. They don't feel good unless they're buying something. It's like Every month they got to go buy something they really almost can't afford. And even though they know that they have bills to pay, and they know that this is really, this debt is going to be a stranglehold on them, they feel like, I just got to buy this. They buy it. That's an addiction. That's not a compulsion. Like me, I'm compelled to make art. I can stop anytime, and I did. I stopped to do conventional commercial art because I needed a paycheck. So I stopped for many years. And then I did cinematography. So I didn't do fine art for many years. So that's how you can tell it's not a convulsion. But I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a obsession. It's not an addiction because you can stop any time. But when you're in a place where you find, and then you're not, and you can do it in a rational way, you can start and stop rationally. You don't start and stop because of influences outside of yourself. You start and stop when you're ready. Nothing else is really, that has the power. You have the power. So, that's that. So, um. So I guess that helps any art people out there. It doesn't even matter what your art form is. Your art form could be music. Your art form could be performance. Your art form, form could be writing, poetry, or any type of writing. It could be fashion design. It could be anything. But, you know, <clears throat> even if I didn't you know if I did make it dime at all painting I would still be painting <laughs> I'd be a bum out in a cardboard box with a paint with an easel set up and some paints <laughs> you know so at that point I guess it is a little bit of a uh Addiction, isn't it? Okay, so um, I think I got a nice layer of paint everywhere I want. Nice coat here. 
Got it covering pretty good everywhere that I believe I need to put it. And again, these layers, you know, when you're working with yellow, the layers are just going to be translucent. That's just all to it. Unless you just put it on a nice, clean color, nice, flat color, you won't notice the translucency. You know, like you could put it on white. Of course, the yellow is just going to look yellow because light is reflecting all of that color back out. But I do want some cool, some, some, some nicely painted uh, motif yellow in here. I do want that. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm painting that in. Getting that in there. Getting it in there. Also, it also helps me to kind of small up some of these black lines. Of course, I usually don't like lines in my paintings too much. But in this case, this is a linear design. So this is an onk and these are lines that help define, because this is a symbol. It's not, it's not like an organic thing. This is a symbol. So, okay, I've been in this, uh, this sitting position for a while and I don't know if my body ever likes sitting in this kind of position for real long periods of time, <laughs> you know, but uh, I think my legs were meant to be straightened out, <laughs> you know, but uh, I'm going to have to straighten my legs out in a minute. So I'm going to get up so they don't go to sleep on me. Because what will happen is you'll get here and I sometimes I forget that I'm painting. I've been here for about 45 minutes in this Indian stance. In this Indian seated, seated position, my legs have, to have totally gone to sleep, man. <laughs> I mean, ain't no circulation going on, you know? And then all of a sudden I go, oh, I gotta get up and get something. And I think I can just pounce up, and my legs are still stuck in that position. <laughs> and then I gotta slowly get the circulation going again. You know, that happens. I've done that live and on camera right here before. It's kind of embarrassing, but hey, since I've been doing these lives, I think I've done my share of embarrassing things. I'm getting used to being embarrassed now. I'm kind of getting used to it. I don't know if that's good or bad. Okay, so now I'm going to see if I have some circulation left in my legs. I believe I have a little something to stand up with. Ow! Yeah, I got to get up slow. But fortunately, I don't have that many people in my room, so it's all right. And then also your hip bone joints can get a little locked in too. So one thing about standing here a little bit, though, I like the way the yellow looks stronger now. It looks good. I like that. And again, that's going to be covered with puffy sky. But like I say, every piece of the painting is a little step at a time. It's just a little bit going at a time. I really do need to get back down there and get on the feet, though. I like to paint the feet better. Uh, but again, there's a day for everything. I'm going to take this moment to uh, sit in a normal chair instead of just on the floor and check out what I've done. Because sometimes you don't see things when you're up close like that, especially you're in a seated position because you're going to be painting a long time. You don't see everything, you know? You just don't see everything. And uh, you miss stuff or something just don't get painted exactly right. And the only way you can really get it is you got to back up off of it and look at it. And I already see two or three things that I could touch up. And I think I am going to touch it up. And uh, two or three things. I'm not going to go all the way back down. I'm going to sit on the apple box this time a little bit. I'll load my brush up with some somewhat fluid, but somewhat thick paint. And I can see why I don't see that when I'm up close, because I really don't. And the angles my head is on, which is usually far above it, I really don't see it as much. 
but I know where it is because I've backed up off of it. I need to paint this in better. Okay. And there's also this part of this arc over here. It's a little bit, could use a little bit cleaning the curve, fixing. Curve gets a little weird right there. Sometimes when you paint, you may try to fix something and you fix it too much. So sometimes it's better just leave it the way it was. <laughs> Not really, just paint it right. But um, like for example, the other day I took that painting, this painting over here, I took it off, off the easel, laid it down flat and painted a little bit on it. <clears throat> because some painting you can do, like now I gotta twist my wrist and this, because my, my ceilings should be bigger. I really should have 12 foot ceilings in here, but I don't. <laughs> I have eight foot ceilings. And probably if I was painting eight foot ceilings, this painting would be, if I had 12 foot ceilings, this painting would be like 11 and a half feet. <laughs> so, you know, knowing me, you know. So, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna max it out, man. So, who knows, who knows. But I, I think I'll be good enough. I, it, my paintings actually wouldn't be, because then it might be a transport issue. And then also it'd be like you limiting the places that you can show your paintings at. Because most people don't have the ability to, to house in a show a painting that's 11 and a half foot tall. You know, now you're talking strictly museum type of stuff and strictly paintings that's gonna be in a mansion or something. But, and again, some people like big paintings like that. So there's, there's something for everybody. Okay, so I think I did a little bit of a correction here. I think I did a little bit of correction. Hopefully that's the right correction that I made. All right, looking good. Okay, so I'm gonna sit this down, I'll go back over, and I'm gonna look and see what I've done. Okay, I didn't tag anybody, so I, don't, I guess I'm not getting as many visitors as I usually do, and I haven't been here in a while, so yeah, that happens, I guess. All right, so I kind of um, sort of fixed something that kind of, like I say, it doesn't always do exactly what you think. You back up from it a little bit more again. And I think I'm going to try to handle it a different way this time. So I can get the right angle on my wrist on this thing. I think I might have to do something like this. Okay, I got some, I got a bad color in my yellow. Like I got some black or something in there. Don't want that. Okay, that's good. Now I'll load up a little bit more. And go over this side. And okay. Sometimes you got to be a bit of a contortionist when you got a limited studio like this. Okay. 
Let's see what I've done. Did I fix anything or did I mess it up? I fixed it. Good. And um, I'm going to leave it that way. I might want to do some erasing on this central one a little bit. So I kind of changed my overall shape. And I don't necessarily like the new shape. So that's pretty good. That's what I really want to do is just reinforce that yellow there. Okay, next what I'm going to do is pick up my palette off the floor. So I don't need to be that low too much anymore today. So now I get to work kind of in the middle and up high to some more. So I'm going to I'm going to go up to the wing here and work on that <clears throat> because this wing is ready. I mean, I've had, I don't even have to touch it. It should be nice. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's set because I haven't, the last time I painted was Sunday. So Monday, Tuesday, this is Wednesday. So that's definitely uh, 72 hours plus. And I don't think I even hit this too much. Even on Sunday, it might have been like uh, Friday. So this is completely set up. So this is good. Uh, now this side I did touch on Sunday and I just want to see something. This side is actually still wet after three days. Some of it's wet, not all of it. But there are some substantial parts of it. But the paint is still, I mean, it is not necessarily tacky is actually drier than it would be if you just freshly painted it but it also depends on how much medium i put in how thick i put it in how much oil was in there you know the oil is disappearing not disappearing but it's uh it's uh catalyzing but not all of the molecules have left the oil yet or been absorbed into the oil yet so what I'm going to do now is recalibrate. I'm going to use this brush here. And I'm just going to, and I really don't want to even tackle this white because I've been using yellow. So I have a cup here that's full of yellow. Medium that's tainted with yellow. So that's no good. That's not going to work for me. So I'm going to pour that out. Let me see. I think I have a container with some yellow or something like that in it. That I can make, yeah, I got orange, so I can put yellow in here and just not waste anything too much. Oops. Every time when I do something, I try to be like picky, picky, too efficient, too saving something. Just, you know, do something like that, like spill oil media, I mean, uh, the, the medium all over my fingers. Didn't mean to do that. I probably should have done with just sucked it out with the towel and just forgot about it. And just let it, let it go, put it in the trash can. But I did. Okay, so I'm going to clean out my medium some because I'm working with white now. So I want some good, clean medium. White is white, and any color is a, a tint of white. And, and I want to make my own tints. I don't want to be have a dirty medium tint. So I'm gonna have to clean out these tints. But and I, you know, like I said, I'm gonna do some stuff in acrylic. I'm gonna do stuff in oil. Be all over the place and do some smaller projects as well, so I can build up a fan base. You know, do some teaching. Maybe get some people looking at my stuff. You know, I also do jewelry too. I've noticed a lot of people have been looking at my jewelry since I've been doing art. You know, they're looking at the jewelry a lot more. You know, the how-tos I'm making 
things out of silver and things. So I might even do some um, shows where I'm in working on a piece, piece of jewelry. You know, why not, you know? But I do have a certain amount of body count when it comes to paintings. <laughs> it's a certain amount of paintings I want to get done. The jewelry is, a lot of times, you know, you see me wearing my jewelry sometimes. Uh, and uh, so the jewelry is kind of like, um, you know, something that is person, you know, a person can actually purchase it. Okay. And... Uh, Affordable, quite quite affordable, because especially if it's silver. Now, if it's if it's diamonds and gold, and you want eighteen karat gold, <laughs> it's going to be expensive, <laughs> because it's diamond and gold. Now, I don't know if you guys are watching, but gold prices have gone up since this pandemic, especially. But um, I don't know if it's, the gold prices go up or down. The gold is just it's just uh, a place to put your money. It's just something, it's an asset, you know. You know, it's a, a commodity. It's something that you buy and trade. Uh, ultimately, if you just have gold, if you just want a placeholder for your money for the long run, gold is a good place to be. But ultimately, you got to be able to trade it <laughs> for it to have value. It's got to be something tradable. It could be anything. You put your money, people put it in anything that can, can trade. The idea is that it holds the value and they put in a dime and they get out a dollar. That's the whole idea is that you don't want to put a, a dollar in and you get 50 cents. That's just not, <laughs> that's not a good place to put your money, you know, if you're trying to save it <laughs> or just in general. I know we buy cars, you know, we put in, you know, buy a car. The average person pay about $50,000 for an automobile. And then in about five years, that automobile is only worth 10% of what they paid for it. <laughs> That's a bad place to put your money, you know. But we like pretty shiny things. We humans like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on this side of the wing today. And, um, you know, and just uh, I have some basic under. The, the, the main way the wing is going, the texturing is nice. And what I did need to do is just add a little bit more structure to this side of the ring. So I'm going to use this apple box to get up a little bit. And I'm going to go into just a little white, a little off-white, slightly off-white, not a lot off. I'm using like a number 12 round synthetic. <clears throat> and what I'm going to kind of do is sketch out with this white. I'm going to sketch out what I call a lead feather. So whenever I'm doing like a, a bird, they have these feathers that's kind of more standoutish and prominent than the other feathers that's on the uh, toward the extremity of the bird's uh, wing uh, configuration. So I'm going to accentuate these feathers in this painting session, and I'm going to accentuate it with this white right here, and just kind of call it out, kind of highlight it. So they can be seen a little bit easier. And I'm just really focusing on right now. I'm focusing where the rim light hits on the, on the feathers because I already got the feathers painted. But I'm looking at the highlight, the rim light, the right light that comes down this way and basically hits one side, the rim, the outer perimeters of one side. So. <clears throat> That's kind of what I'm focusing on now. And they're little rim-like feathers, highlights within, little feathers within the cluster of feathers. And I kind of want to just kind of sketch in where those are going to be, sort of, with this white. I mean, it's painting, it's not sketching, but I'm painting in, I should say, since I sketch. That's the wrong word. I like to use it because it's meta nature sesh sketch. The word sketch comes from that, so I use that a lot because I like anything Kemet. Okay. Uh, 
And I just want to accentuate these. And I'm trying to get a somewhat fluid white, but a covering white. A nice presence to the white paint in terms of the thickness of it. But sometimes it's hard to get that fluid white and get the covered white at the same time. So I try to get the covering earlier, earlier sections. Right now, I'm still trying to get the covering, but I'm erring on the side of having my paint more fluid. so that I can make the quality of line that I want, or the quality of shape, or the edge of the paint, the edge of the feather, because again, I'm painting the rim light. So I'm painting the edge. Again, I'm using a number 12 round. This is a Simply Simmon brush, by the way. So I can tell you, because a lot of times different brushes, their number sizing is different. <laughs> You know, so if you tell a person the exact brush, then they know exactly the size you're using. Simply Simmons Synthetic. It works well with both acrylic and oil, by the way. These little cluster of feathers to me, they're just very important to just get these right. Because I think they're beautiful, actually, personally. That's one of the reasons I like painting it. I think these little clusters of feathers are beautiful. And I just want to just do the little accent feathers. I'm not trying to paint every single feather. I'm just doing an accent rim light on certain feathers, not on all of the feathers, just certain ones. Just want them to stand out more, to call out them, make sure that they're getting noticed. Of course, this is just the beginning of this bit of painting. Because you know, I start out with the highlight. So right now I'm putting in the highlight. popping in the highlight and I have a fairly dark tone that's dry so I'm painting wet on the dry right on there so I'm painting this white highlight on a dry black well gray dark gray different colors of gray and it's giving me a very very exactly what I want because I'm getting no bleed from the underlying color because it's totally dry which is great it's exactly what I want And I'm mixing a little bit of medium into this titanium white, trying to get it to flow so I can really get very painterly and paint exactly the shapes I want in these feathers. So I want my feathers to be expressive. I want them to have some, some sense of expression to them, if I can. Now these are the accentuated feathers. These are the feathers that are, uh, what I call it controlling feathers, that the bird used to control the feathers is more toward the extremity. do a, a big paint eventually a big one in acrylic I usually do big ones in oils but really oil acrylics all the same really I mean they handle different and there might be some advantages and of course I need to explore those
is really just trying to get a nice expressive line quality, well, of quality of brush stroke, I should say, out of this. So I can have a really nice expressive feather if I can get that. Now, I could be using a thinner brush, but I'm able to get, by putting different levels of pressure down, I'm able to get variation in the, um, the stroke, the line stroke that I'm putting down. Creating some volume and then making it wispy and soft at the same time, like wispy and thin and elegant at the same time. These brush strokes here, I'm not trying to do so much go back and forward, just trying to lay them in. Okay, so there. Now these are really, really starting to kind of pop forward. I need to dampen them backwards, so I'm going to dampen them backwards a little bit. For right now, I just need them to kind of come forward some. I want to back up all for that a little bit. Okay, so now what I want to do is just to model these just a little bit more. So to do that, I'm going to get a, another brush with a darker tone on it. It's going to be this brush here. I think I'm going to put a little bit of Mars Black on my palette. And I'm gonna start putting the modeling tones in. To do that, I'm just I'm not even gonna use a lot of medium here. I'm just gonna kind of just go in with a dark black. And I do have that color that's just it's wet. So not everything is wet on dry, some of it is wet on wet at this point. I'm just gonna kind of start separating, modeling it out to create some depth. So it's going to be a lot of me walking, getting, walking away from the painting, looking, coming back, walking away from the painting, looking, coming back, kind of stuff going on. 
Also, I think I'm gonna get another brush. I should have had my uh, a shirt with a pocket on it. I'm gonna get another brush that's gonna be like my gray color. So I'm just gonna mix a little bit of gray here. And it's gonna be mostly white, but gray. Cause I'm gonna top down some of these tones is too white. Let me put some more white on it because I got too much black in that gray. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my dark tones, start establishing these shadows, just the modeling. I already put the highlights in, and I always go like light, dark, light, dark. I like to do that a lot. You know, put the opposites together. And what it is, I do have some light that's wet on here with this darker tone that's in the brush. So it's by virtue of using it, and kind of stippling, stippling, stipple painting this in, I'm creating grays for my modeling here. Now I'm gonna go to that gray brush that I have to kind of just put a little bit of um, relief beside that highlight color. And that's working out pretty good. Going back, just getting into some modeling here. It's right against that light color that I just put on there. Creating some shadow, some modeling of the shadow. I'm trying to create some depth. I'm going back to my gray brush, giving some more gray. Tapping down some of this. I'm going back to my dark. Okay, and of course, I don't want to stay there too long because when you see things close, it's not necessarily the same as what it is when you back up. So in this case that I'm doing a modeling, I want to back up quite a bit. I go in close and I want to back up. I want to go in close and I want to back up. I don't want to stay close too long because then I'll start, you know, painting a close-up painting. That's good when you get details, but you don't get the overall, you want to get the overall just of this thing in there. 